I now declare the Plano City Council preliminary open meeting is reconvened in open session that all council members are present. Our first item uh, on the preliminary agenda is consideration and action resulting from the executive session. Our next item is housing tax credit process. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. Um, I just wanted to provide a very brief update tonight about our uh, steps in getting that housing tax credit application process updated. Um, as you know, at the end of November, there was direction from City Council to move forward with procuring a um, consultant that would be able to assist the city in reviewing our housing tax credit process. Um, that was a little more challenging than expected, but we have procured a consultant at this point. So I just wanted to provide you the update on that. Um, we are looking at about a four month process. Um, we will start um, very, very soon, uh, probably within the next week or so, with meeting with that consultant, having them review the housing tax credit application process that we have currently. Then we will move into to a public engagement process. So we will be meeting with various stakeholders, including any of those housing developers that have proceeded through the housing tax credit application program in the past, or ones that have said that they are interested in proceeding with those in the future. Um, we will also provide some opportunities for you and also the CRC to possibly participate if that's the desire of the council and for the CRC. Then the plan would be is for us to look at benchmarking cities. So we are gonna be having our consultant look at other cities within the state of Texas that have housing tax credit application processes. And then he will finally make a recommendation um, that we will be bringing back to the city council um, at the end of that, that process. So just wanted to give a quick update, see if there were any questions regarding um, the plan to proceed um, and make myself available if you had anything you wanted to discuss. Thanks, Lori. Appreciate sure. that. Absolutely. Any, any questions uh, for Lori? Go ahead. So um, I understand we're getting the consultant. When do you think, when do you expect mm -hmm. that to happen? And, you know. Well, I've already talked to him today, so we're planning to have our kickoff meeting um, on Thursday. So we're hoping to get it really moving very quickly. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Saved you some time on your agenda. Thank you. Next item is the update and discussion and direction. Uh, Short-term rental task force. Christina. All right. Good evening, Mayor, Council, and Executives. I am here to talk about an update on short-term rental task force, uh, which is part of the recommended process from our um, outreach consultant gap strategy. So we wanted to talk to you about how this might work. So I have some details on, for that, uh, about that this evening. So I'll start kind of at ground level, um, where we are with short-term pro uh, rental process. The issue um, was initiated several years ago, um, council's given direction, we've been working on outreach and data collection, and then more recently, uh, council's directed interim measures, we've got a joint meeting scheduled on May 8th, we anticipate out of that meeting we'll start collecting additional data and results on any tools that are implemented there. Thru through that next step, We'll, of outreach and data collection will have a public process that will be utilized to develop solutions, assess effectiveness of the current tools that we have, and recommend more permanent measures. That's modeled off of the Arlington process that we've discussed extensively. And then at the end of this, we will uh, be able to adopt some permanent measures uh, based on outreach, data, research, and recommendations of the community. Um, and those may replace or continue interim measures as we see fit. So based on that, the GAP Strategies team has recommended that we utilize a number of public outreach tools, including a community survey, a website, 
a town hall that will be both in person and virtual to give more people opportunities to participate, as well as media support and information. And that will all lead to a phase one report. So the timeline for that looks like this. The community survey would go live in the middle of April and run for a month with results coming out in May. A website would start the same date as the survey and run through the end of the project. So it would be a unique website to the project and then the city would take that on at the end of the project. The in-person and virtual town hall would be scheduled for late July or early August and um, it would be a, a in-person, um, we again have, don't have a date for that yet, but then it would run after the in-person meeting, it would run for another week, so people would have an opportunity to participate online. And then finally, we'd be working with our communications department. We've already had a meeting with them about how we can do social media support and traditional media support and continue to get information out to the community uh, throughout the process. So this is a little less refined, but because it's the phase two outreach, I think this will be informed by the phase one project. Um, it will involve reconvening the task force, continuing the social media outreach, the stakeholder outreach, um, a second town hall event, um, more public information, education outreach on potential outcomes, and then a final report, and then ongoing updates to PNZ and council. So with that, GAP Strategies did recommend using a task force. This is a clip that came straight out of their proposal. It does show that they are interested in this group because they believe they'll help define the project goals, um, gain the community feedback and input from a group of stakeholders, also help us kind of carefully walk through the alternatives and options that are presented. And they're looking at two to three meetings of the task force in the first phase, so not a really um, substantial time commitment, but still something that um, is meaningful. So this process would work with a June meeting of the task force based on the initial survey results, July meeting, feedback on town hall content, and then in August, they would participate in a pop-up meeting in town to help gain more feedback. And then you see we also have scheduled updates to the Planning and Zoning Commission and City Council in July and September. So who would be on the STR task force? Well, that's what we need to discuss with you. Um, this is a list of potential groups that we thought might have a stake in this process. So you see we've identified 12 different groups uh, based on feedback to date. And we uh, have a recommendation from our consultant that the group uh, be limited to um, no less than 12, but no more than 20 members to encourage uh, robust conversation. So we've given just a couple of possible um, configurations. Um, we think that a lot of this, a lot of the initial um, groups could be Plano residents. Um, in fact, all of them could potentially be Plano residents, um, but we're not sure that we'll be able, especially uh, the Apartment Association, Hotel Association, we're not 100% sure we'll be able to get representatives from Plano um, or from a management platform, um, but we will try to get Plano residents on those, um, but the rest of the group, such as the Collin County Association of Realtors, Chamber of Commerce, where we feel confident that we can get uh, Plano residents on those uh, to represent uh, the organization on uh, this stake, uh, this task force. So we have a couple of decision points for you this evening. The first being just flat out, do you want to appoint a task force to participate in this process? <clears throat> The benefits being that we'd gain a variety of perspectives. They'd help, again, carefully vet the issues, make policy recommendations. Um, we want to be upfront that we don't know whether we can gain consensus from the group, um, but 
one of the benefits is that we would potentially have a group of advocates for any compromise position um, that is supported by the group. And um, then if not, does the work of the task force default task force defaults to the Planning and Zoning Commission, or is there some other group that would do the work um, if it is not uh, done by the task force? So with that, I will leave you with this initial question. Thanks, Christina. Um, I, I have, let me get four speakers in, uh, if, if you don't mind. Uh, this is this really a direction on the task force. Obviously, you're seeing the, the question for us. So um, uh, we have we have four speakers. Let's go ahead and, and call them down. And if, if you guys don't mind, just two minutes per speaker. The first one, uh, the first speaker is Bill France, followed by Cindy Patillo. <clears throat> Mayor Martin, City Council, thanks for uh, continuing to support this important initiative. Uh, I'd like to address the task force at this point, since this is, uh, I think, the most critical uh, versus this. Um, the task, the importance. Uh, of a task force, the first question we would say, what do we want to accomplish with a task force? And I think it's important to gain lots of different perspectives. However, what we've seen historically is that task forces are loaded with folks who want short-term rentals and they tend to be stacked and then it turns into a, a vote. Uh, this, we've seen this happen in Dallas. We've seen it happen in many other cities. So what I caution you against is having the task force be anything than a collection of information and not a voting mechanism. Uh, the law is clear uh, about what uh, we expect um, the city to be able to do, which is you all have the authority um, to regulate how we conduct ourselves um, as a community in residential neighborhoods. And there may be areas that where it's appropriate to, uh, to conduct um, a hotel or a short-term rental, but they are clearly not part of what we expect in a single-family residential neighborhood. So we just want to be clear about that. Um, I appreciate uh, all the good efforts that have been made, and uh, we hopefully expect a positive uh, outcome. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, City Council. Um, I just want to chat with you, as I have before, about the home located behind mine. Little different presentation this evening. That home was recently leased to a family while their permanent home undergoes renovation. So for the first time in several years, I have a neighbor. I've not had to call the police once since that family moved in. I barely hear a peep out of them. There's no noise. There's no parties, there's no people sitting in the hot tub talking and laughing at midnight, there's no trash, there's no parking issues, because I have a neighbor. There has been so much angst and so much conversation about property rights of short-term rental owners, and now that I don't live next to one, I am reminded how important my property rights are and how much I have missed having them. Whether this house is temporarily not a short-term rental or whether we eventually get rid of these things in single family residential neighborhoods, there is a way out for the property owner. The house behind mine is leased. That property owner, it has an income. They just don't have it from a short term rental. Without short term rentals being allowed, this owner has an out. All short term rental owners have an out. I do not. I cannot pivot and get my home back I can't make an adjustment that eliminates the issues of having that short-term rental house behind mine. I cannot stop the owner of the house behind mine from once again converting it to a short-term rental. 
I don't understand how the few hundred short-term rental owners in the city have way seconds. more property rights than I do. I can't fathom that that's right, and I want it resolved. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> the next speaker is Mark Cherney, followed by Zoe Sanchez Reveal. My name is Mark Cherney, live here in Plano, Mayor Munns and Council. Thanks for allowing me to speak tonight on the short-term rental issue. I'm sorry for any incidents that ever happen, short-term rental or not, they're tragedies. We don't have a short-term rental in Plano, but we do plan to re uh, when we retire. Our STR is in a different state, and we maintain super host status, and that's from being a good manager. There is an STR <laughs> right across the street from us here in Plano. Neighbors and us have no complaints. In fact, we've met a lot of great people that have been there for a week or two or a month or two. Great people. Uh, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxson does not want to ban STRs in the state of Texas. We all pay a lot of property taxes here in Plano. We've worked hard all our lives. We choose to own this home in Plano, not in a HOA, and we should be able to use it as we see fit. Banning STRs is an infringement on our, on our personal freedoms, property rights, and future income. I'm fine with a task force. I think it's a good idea. How do you load it? That's absolutely a good, good question. But limited regulations, licensing and taxes, as long as other rules such as noise, parking restrictions apply to all homes in Plano. I'd suggest doing a one week minimum stay. Makes it cost prohibitive for someone that's booking it for a party on the weekend. And by the way, we've never had that problem. We have a no party rule, age restrictions, minimum stay, outside cameras. We let the guests know what the rules and regs are. At a recent council meeting, someone stated there's about 600 short-term rentals in Plano. I wonder where that number came from. We did a look this afternoon. There's over a thousand on Airbnb in Plano alone, and there's other seconds. platforms. So that number was off by probably about 50%. This is not an STR issue. It's a management issue. Thank you. City Council, Mayor, I have a little short clip that I want you all to listen to of my daughter. Make clothes in our house. Some dummies make what in our house? Some the hole, make the holes with the bullet. Oh, the hole with the bullet. Mm -hmm. Oh. Those are some dummies. Yeah, they were dummies too. Yeah, they were Mm -hmm. I'm back here tonight to remind you that short-term rentals do not belong in zones for single-family residences. Although it's been over a month since a bullet pierced through my home, we still live with the repercussions of the actions of the owner of 2044 Cans Drive, who were more concerned about financial gains than the actual well-being of neighbors. As you heard, my daughter continues to speak about the incident, something a three-year-old should not have to deal with at such an innocent age. I continue to work through the fear, anxiety, and uncertainty that being in my own home is not safe. With that being said, I'm here to hold you accountable and to remind you that the lives of your constituents who will be voting in the city elections are worth the tax dollars and the litigations to keep them safe. We are worth more than a party and a barbecue. I know that if this was going on beside you or if your child's or grandchildren's home was violated, you would be doing the same thing. This isn't a plea of passion, but a plea for a basic right to feel safe in your own home. I also wanted to take this time to thank those council members who really support this cause. We really do appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, now we can ask any questions or 
comments that you want to have. Uh, Council Member Riccinelli, I think you had your hand up. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I was just going to address the, the task force question and, you know, to the point that uh, I believe uh, uh, Bill France and Cindy Patillo uh, made, um, I, I think a task force is a great idea. Looking at the, the, the uh, uh, proposed distribution of members, I saw, you know, quite a number of uh, business associations, which I think should be represented, and, and, and that's great. These are great groups that need to have a voice. I only saw, uh, I believe, two uh, HOA elected board representative and Plano Neighborhood Coalition that would represent uh, single family homeowners in the city of Plano, which is the majority of our housing stock. And so for only three out of 16 spots, I know this is not a final distribution, uh, you know, to, to be, um, you know, to be composed of, of people who live in, in single family homes in Plano, I think would, it just wouldn't be broadly representative of the community. And so I think if we do do a task force, we need to make sure that it's that it's broadly representative of the people who live and own property in the city of Plano. Um, you know, the other thing that I thought was a good idea was a task force for collection of information, but not for decision making. Obviously, the people have elected us to, to make decisions about what the ordinances of the city of Plano should be. And I, I think we're we're capable of making those decisions. Mayor and Council, just for clarification, um, this is the uh, decision-making board. So a recommendation would come through P through a committee to PNZ, and then ultimately the decision always comes to the city council. So they would not be empowered to uh, to pass anything at, at that point. So that would be the, the normal process. Additionally, if if council again going from that 12 to 20 recommendation, right now we have 12 and 16 up there. So if council did want to add. Uh, a couple of positions to, to those categories in order to, to uh, more appropriately weight that. Uh, I think we're open to that and the consultants. Again, this was just a recommendation from them. So if that's necessary, that's uh, something that could be amended uh, right here. Councilmember Grady. Thank you. Um, as I was listening to the presentation, as I was listening to the speakers, um, I was taking notes and this is really kind of where I came to a conclusion looking upon this list. Um, I, I think you'll get information. Um, I'm not saying whether you're going to get the right information, but what I'm saying is you'll get information. I don't see this particular list being a consensus building unit that's going to provide you any kind of go forward decisions because what I see, and this is only my interpretation, but what I see is probably um, the instrument of disagreement coming through the various organizations and having probably 16 different opinions to deal with. I think we've dealt with task forces in the past um, and we've seen some of the end results and how long it can take. So if we approach it, I believe, from an informational gathering standpoint, um, and getting various perspectives from individuals, and that is the, that is the, um, uh, the objective, then I think that we will probably get information. I don't know if it'll be operational information, but we will get information. There's no doubt in my mind we'll get information, and we will get strong opinions on both sides. I don't know if we'll ever meet in the middle with this particular list. Um, and so that's my only concern is getting 16 people in a room um, that we have to then um, provide police protection for themselves. <laughs> we can we can definitely add police protection to the budget to make sure that that, that works. But but I think I think part of the part of the um, consultants' experience was making sure that um, you know all voices have a seat at the table from across the community. So to your point of gathering information. But also uh, knowing that uh, hopefully we, we have the majority of these as residents and business owners in Plano. So understanding that uh, the, the difficult challenge um, with, with a, a decision like this, but making sure that it did represent that for information purposes was exactly what we were looking or what the consultant had recommended from the uh, list. Mayor Pro Tem. Yeah, I have some similar thoughts to <laughs> Council Member Grady from some of the other task forces that we barely made our way through. So um, I would also like to just make sure we're clear up front so that everybody understands what we're trying to achieve. Um, and so the, the council is very clear about what our expectations are coming out of this. 
I do think that for the downtown and legacy residents, it would be great if the downtown resident was a homeowner and the legacy resident, if that was um, uh, legacy, legacy West or, you know, shops of legacy, if that was a, uh, a homeowner or a, someone in a town home or something like that, I think that would help with our um, upping the homeowners on this list. Um, I do agree that having more homeowners would be helpful on this list. I did have another question though. With your consultant, is their whole purpose to run this task force or are there opportunities for them to get us some more research that could help us in our decision-making process, for example? Do they have the ability to research things like as we're looking at zoning districts and the impacts of doing that? So looking at Arlington or other places down in Texas that have done that, when you implement a zoning district, um, what happens to those specific mm -hmm. zoning districts? If you move all STRs to one location, things like that, will they be able to provide data points like that to us? I think their focus is really the public outreach. Staff has done a lot of research on various zoning amendments and has a whole spreadsheet of short-term rental uh, regulations and what's been happening across the country. So we have that information to bring forward through the process um, as that's needed. Okay, so you're saying you, you can get us information like that from... Uh Absolutely, and they do have planners on, they have planners and a legal representative as part of their team, so absolutely the zoning component is is part of it, but I don't think that's the primary focus. I think it's, it's really to hear what's happening in the community and get feedback, but that would be listening to people's opinions about zoning issues, if that makes sense. Okay. Well, I'd love to, if, if we're going down the path of zoning, is that something that we've discussed looking at? I think that would be a really important piece of information for all of us to know, and the Zoning Commission as well. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Pro Tem, just go down the list. Christine, so I, I have a few questions, um, just to get some clarification. So at this point, the task force duty is specifically just to gather all the potential issues, comments, and opinions in City of Plano. A am I correct about that? I think they're giving the consultants and staff feedback on like things like the survey results and helping us figure out, okay, we're gonna do this town hall. Do you have comments on the content of the town hall and how you think this should be done? So we may present, okay, here we've looked at uh, STR practices in the nation, and we think these are most applicable to Plano. Do you agree? Do you have other ideas? How, you know, kind of vetting the content before it goes out to the public more broadly. So there's sort of a um, sounding board for staff through the process. So ultimately, though, we are going down the road of trying to find a, a solution to the STR issue that we're facing right now. That is correct. So that is that's exactly what the task force is doing, is providing, with, uh, pro providing us with more potential solutions or options and that alternatives. Is, that is correct. But that does not deviate from what we're doing right now, which is to go down the road of trying to um, obviously register, um, getting licenses, and, and trying to, and, and another question I have is our potential interim, um, interim moratorium on short-term rental. Am I correct about that too? That is correct. You see the, so the initial slide I had about the kind of parallel processes, mm -hmm. if I can get back there efficiently for you. Um, so the interim measures will still go into effect and then this outreach and data collection that's being managed that's separate. is separate. That's correct. Now another, um, uh, I guess, suggestion that I have is I would recommend just like what um, um, Councilman Riccadelli said, I think we need more residential air, uh, uh, input from different areas of Plano. Okay. Um, also different um, social economic groups and different ethnic cultural background groups. Um, we can't just have it from you know West Plano or just from East Plano, but, but rather we need to have a little bit more um, intermingling with regard to um, whether or not it's cultural, racial, uh, religious, 
um, some sort of mix so that we're getting actually a whole, ver whole view of um, what Plano is all about. Um, if there's a need for language assistance, I, I would suggest that we put something together that has language assistance. And, and that's all I really have. Thank you. Can, can I clarify something? Because you said interim moratorium, and that has a very specific legal definition and pro, um, process related to it. And I think what you meant is interim ban, and I just wanted to clear that up. That's correct. Councilmember Williams. <coughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think it's appropriate that these various associations have a seat at the table, but if this is to be a decision-making body, then I think it's appropriate that it will did I, did I not understand that this body was to provide the recommendations which would then come before us? Actually, the process that we had outlined was this, this body helps advise on what goes to planning and zoning, and planning and zoning makes the recommendation to the city council right. for our normal zoning So it's process. a gate. It, it's a gate, but it's information. Data gathering. More information. More information. Okay. Um, well, it doesn't really change my assessment. I think that the ultimate recommendations that are passed along should be exclusively by residents of Plano. I think they should get the feedback um, from various associations, hotel association, um, apartment associations, et cetera. But the people who are actually Living. voting to make the recommendations to pass along to the Planning and Zoning Commission should be residents of Plano, just as this body is, all, we're all required to be residents of Plano and everybody we appoint to our boards and commissions are required to be residents of Plano, though we do partner with all members of our community, our, our associations, businesses, et cetera, but they aren't appointed to our boards and commissions. So I feel very strongly that they should all be Plano residents and that that should be the hat they're wearing. If they are incidental members of an association, like any one of us might be, or business owners in Plano, when we step onto this dais, we are acting as a council member, not as a business owner or association member. I feel very strongly about that, that this task force should be uh, comprised accordingly. Councilmember Holmer, any thoughts? I don't really have anything to add other than the fact I feel that the residents who live in non-HOA, non-mandatory HOAs need to be very carefully weighted or more, more weighted because I know that's a lot of the frustration. People that already live in a mandatory HOA have some, um, some recourse. They have some things that they can do, and it's the, we have a lot of uh, neighborhoods in Plano that do not have a mandatory HOA, so I want to make sure that we are making sure that they are probably even more so represented than, than the mandatory HOAs. Councilmember Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, the, the first thing I'd like to ask Christina is, do you see, when you look at putting this together, is there a way to compress this time frame? frame? I'm just, I'm a little concerned that we're talking, we're here we are in spring of 23, and we're talking about summer or mid-24 uh, to get recommendations back. And, and I know, I guess, you know, we, we have our meeting coming up with, with PNZ, uh, you know, to discuss some of these issues uh, next month. But do, do you think this could be shortened so we can get feedback from however this task force is construed to get back from those individuals? Um, I think that we're trying to follow the Arlington model of doing a deliberative process so that, so we have defensible data, feedback, that it's very uh, clear, and um, just clear information that we have for the council. So I think that with the temporary measures that we're discussing next month, I hope that that is helpful to the community. And then hopefully that will buy us some time to go through this process and get the data and the information we need to make a really firm decision that follows the guidance of council on the Arlington model of um, really a data-driven process. So that's the way it's structured. I, I am concerned if we start compressing it that we lose the, um, the justifications that we have through that model. Um, so can it be compressed? Yes. Do you get the same outcome? I think the answer is no. Okay. So the time frame looks good to you. So, uh, but if, if during our meeting, when we have our joint meeting with, with PNZ, uh, if we are get together and we do implement an interim, you know, ban uh, on this process, as Deputy Mayor uh, was was discussing, 
that you don't see that interfering you know, or tainting the process with the citizen uh, task force. No, in fact, I think that could help our process because it gives us data through the process so we can actually be me making measurements through a registration program or something like that. If Specifically, the registration program, I think, really helps us because we have more data. Great, great. No, I, th I think this is good. I, I, I'm not extremely concerned about getting a, a good group of task force people together. I know we went through the same discussions when we put together the compre uh, comprehensive plan uh, task force or commission that turned out. And I think it, that worked out very well. We had people from two opposite you know, ends of the spectrum and they all managed to come together and coalesce and come up with, with what ended up being a great plan. So I, I think that that will, uh, uh, will happen here, but, uh, but I do think, um, you know, hopefully there's concurrence at, at our May, uh, May meeting that we do hit the pause button with, uh, at least with an interim, uh, you know, ban to give uh, time for the fact gathering to come to fruition and give us all the information from these groups as well as from our citizens. And, and, and I do support what Councilman Williams said is I, I really think one of the requirements should be that they are, are Plano residents because this does affect Plano, it doesn't affect Collin County, well, it does affect Collin County, but it's really our residents that, that I'm concerned about. So that, I, I think we're on the right track. I wish we could compress the time frame, but I think it's more important to get it right uh, than it is to do it uh, too fast. So thanks. Thank you, Councilman Smith. So I, I think we all agree that uh, the task force needs to be a, 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 a wide array of, of Plano residents, if that's at all possible. Uh, the owners uh, uh, all being a part of Plano and even the management uh, being a part of Plano when, when it comes to uh, identifying this task force. Is everybody okay with that? So two other aspects real quick. I heard the, um, the downtown and legacy being property owners as well, mm -hmm. and I saw heads nodding around the dais that that was a, an okay suggestion. I heard the, the non-HOA representation I saw heads nodding around uh, around the dais as well. So I take it that the addition of a, of a couple of positions within that um, from the residential perspective was was uh, basically where council landed. Councilman? Well, and, and thank you. Thank you, Mark, for that. So just to, to clarify, because I think different council members mm -hmm. uh, may have said different things about this. Are we envisioning this being more like the Envision Oak Point Steering Committee, which was a group of, you know, stakeholders that weren't, you know, necessarily yes. making a recommendation, just providing feedback, not like the CPRC, yes. right? We're not, we're not That's talking about doing correct. like a That's correct. correct. Okay, I'm, yes. I'm good with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think this just is really, sure. really yeah. to give That's a good information analogy. feedback. That, that is. That's a good yeah. analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. I think All we right. have direction. Thank you. Uh, next item. Just... Discussion and Direction of Community Relation Commission Grant Process and Related Policies. Good evening again, Council, Mayor, and City Executives. Um, we wanted to follow up on last meeting um, and provide you some additional information regarding the consolidated grant process that is administered by the Community Relations Commission. Joined with me tonight is Johnny Singh, who is the Chair of the Community Relations Commission. So halfway through our presentation tonight, I'm going to turn it over to him. So just a little history of the Community Relations Commission. Um, it, as you noted in your memo, we did have uh, two commissions that were joined together in 1998, creating the Community Relations Commission. Um, per your ordinance, uh, this commission reviews human social needs and recommends funding allocations to city council. In 2020, city council amended their responsibilities to include the uh, low-income housing tax credit review and recommendations. And then in 2022, city council amended the board makeup for positions um, that was specific to the conservative revitalization plan area. In addition, city council appoints all of the members of the CRC and neighborhood services serves as staff to the CRC. 
So just wanted to give a very brief overview of the consolidated grant process. I'm not going to read through all of this, but um, essentially uh, our grant recipients have to uh, attend two, one of two mandatory meetings um, in, or in late January. We do provide technical assistance for one-on-one -on -one with staff to help them with the applications that are submitted to the CRC. Our online application asks that they submit their uh, applications by March 1st each year, so all of the nonprofits submit an online uh, application. We do the administrative review as required, uh, the staff does by CRC as part of the uh, scoring rubric and you'll be able to review that on, uh, with Chair Singh. Um, the CRC then spends time reviewing the application and scoring that. They have a series of public meetings that are about six of them held from April through May. They actually started their meetings um, with the applicants for this year last week. Um, and then there is public hearing deliberation by the CRC for funding um, to recommend to city council. So annually, the CRC does review the consolidated grant process, and they may make modifications to that. Um, they have to make any modifications on the consolidated grant process prior to January of the upcoming budget year in order to make sure that there is enough time to get the recommendations um, as part of the city council budget process. Just noted, uh, the last major change to this process was in 2018. There was a removal of a staff recommendation on consolidated grant applications. The CRC developed a scoring rubric for the members to utilize in reviewing both the submitted applications as well as in-person presentations. And then they created funding calculations that relate to the overall application score and the percentage of funding allocations. And I am going to turn it over to Chair Singh to continue the presentation and explain the CRC's rubric. Good evening, uh, City Council, Mayor, and City Executives. My name is Johnny Singh. I have the honor of being the chairperson of the Community Relations Commission. And I'm, I am on behalf, I'm here on behalf of this uh, Community Relations Commission, CRC. We are, as you are well aware, we are a commission composed of nine members appointed by City Council on two year staggered terms. And for the last 15 years, we have been entrusted as CRC with the important responsibility of making recommendations for the allocation of uh, the grant proceeds dollar um, to, to the city council. And, and um, each year, we, the CRC, we review the process of the consolidated grant process. And uh, we have chosen to adopt a rubric as part of our decision-making process. And sometimes a process is, uh, the value of a process is best understood in contrast to the alternative. And the alternative was that prior to 2018, CRC uh, got together upon, upon uh, the public hearings from the, the grant applicants, got together and decided in, around a round table um, how much each organization were to get without the use of a rubric. And so to their credit, at some point in time, they recognized that the, the money, these are city money of the Plano constituents that's, that goes into the funding of the grant proceeds, and these are funded by taxpayers, uh, administered by the city staff, and overseen by the city council, uh, that's, that's then utilized by the uh, nonprofit organizations um, in service to the beneficiaries of the communities. So all these parties, city staff, uh, city council, beneficiaries, organizations, these are all stakeholders that CRC and the recommendation of the grant proceeds should be accountable for. And that's really just the genesis of why they came upon the adoption of a rubric-based process in their recommendation of grant proceeds dollar. And since 2018, for, for consecutive five years, including this year, we have reviewed the process and we have continued the use of a rubric. And just just for a bit, we've all utilized rubrics in, in, in um, in, in schools, in our work, and, but just in simplistic terms, rubrics are our sentiments and expectations put into words. And so, um, and, and so I wanna take the opportunity to kind of, in my time with you, to outline the rubric that CRC has adopted for the current grant year process. And with that opportunity also kind of explain the rationale. And some of the, as mentioned in the slide, um, Part of the positives of the rubric 
the purpose of the rubric is the accountability to your many stakeholders that the CRC is responsible for. It also ensures integrity process by having, by having stated goals and expectations, uh, organizations that come as applicants to CRC for the grant consolidated data grant process, they know what to expect and what they're being graded on. Um, let's move on to the next slide. So our, our score and rubric um, is based on a 100-point system. You'll see that there's an overweighting on the written application of 60 points, public hearings 30 points, administrative 10 points. Um, now just for your reference, um, we see uh, uh, the Community Relations Commission, we see up to 30 applications per year. And for, for uh, the rules of quorum, our only two main touch points with these organizations are the written application and the public hearing. So we, um, and, and many of our commissioner members, of which there are nine, uh, we come from a background that's not wholly familiar with nonprofit organizations. So um, from, upon the receipt of a written application, they are to get familiarized and be able to score them. So um, as analog written applications, the equivalent of, of kind of the SAT scores and the evaluation of the sufficiency of the applicants. So, um, so our written application, it's, uh, it's a 35 question, applica uh, 35 question application and it's scored by the CRC. We have broken down, um, um, the purpose of written application is really to evaluate who the organization is, what is the mission they're serving, whom they're serving in the community, and also their operating competencies along their financial wherewithal. And these are, these criterion in evaluating is really just bite-sized, um, you know, bite-sized attributes for CRC to evaluate from a score perspective. We also have the public hearing, which consists of a maximum 30 points. And, uh, and let, me, let me just kind of utilize some of these questions as an example. Did the speaker effectively answer the public hearing questions in the allotted time? On the surface, it may appear that we are, um, I, we may be, it may appear that we're focusing on, um, you know, being, being sticklers on time, but reality is, we're trying to, this is, the public hearing is the only opportunity for the commission to ask questions of the applicants. So we want to, by putting a value weighted system, we want to incentivize the uh, organizations to bring their subject matter experts to, to the public hearing. So they're able to provide answers to um, their applications and to our commission. And then lastly, the third component of the, the rubric is a maximum of 10 points, and this is awarded for the, by the city staff. And then, and then at the end of the process, all the, all the scores from the nine commissioners are averaged, and we have chosen to utilize a calculation uh, based on the score of each applicant's. So for example, if the applicant was to score 86, which would be within a range of 85 to 89 points, then 90% of the applicant's funding requests would be funded. And we, we thought that that was, uh, as opposed to getting to a round table and discussing arbitrarily how much dollars each organization should, should receive, we, we just thought a more of an automated service would serve uh, for the purpose of transparency and for the purpose of um, ensuring that there's equal access to a fair process for the applicant organizations. All right, with that, I am open to any questions. Thank you, appreciate it very much so. Mayor Pro Tem. Can you go back to your previous slide? Yes. So what is the purpose of not allowing a new grant applicant to achieve the maximum 10 points? You know, it's a, it's a value weighting system that based on the discussions by our commission members, we felt that 
Um, track record is really important. You know, for, the, for these organizations that come before us, they define their, um, their mission statement, but we also evaluate them on operating competency and financial wherewithal. And a big component of that is having a track record. And so for organizations that has received prior funding, we, the city, the city staff, has the opportunity to evaluate whether they have met uh, the contract needs of the, the grant funding. So it's really just to encourage kind of adherence to a prior contract rewarding <clears throat> grant proceeds. So, but could that, some, I guess an organization could have a great track record of serving people, right? But they could just not have received funding from us before. So could that keep us from just continuing to give the same money over and over again to the same organizations without looking to maybe a new organization that has a new innovative way to serve people? Sure, and they, and they certainly could. But uh, if you wait, if you look at our... Um, rubric calculation for the awarding of dollars. Uh, okay. uh, typically that five points is not the breaking point for the organization receiving dollars. Typically the organization is not, um, they're going to receive dollars and they're going to be able to achieve that first year of accomplishment. But we're certainly open as a, as we deliberate this process every single year. So we're certainly open to any feedback if if council members have. Yeah, I just don't want it to look like to outside organizations that they're already at a disadvantage so that we would keep people from even applying. If they think, oh, well, they just want to keep the sure. organizations they had. I don't want other organizations to think, oh, we shouldn't apply to Plano because they give preferential treatment to the ones that they've already given to in the past. Sure. And I can certainly bring that feedback back to our commission. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Williams. I defer to uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> I actually have a recommendation and, and a suggestion. First of all, I think to the point of Mayor Pro Tem, um, we, we really, I, I would like to see more, um, a variety, a diverse group of, um, uh, I guess, nonprofits that like to come in and try to seek um, our fund and our grants. But in order to do that, I also do not want to see, you know, our regulars, our quote-unquote regulars, to be, you know, sort of ousted. I, I would like to see whether or not there's any way where we could potentially put aside a certain area, you know, percentage of funding in which we could focus on those individuals that we have never, ever heard from before. Now, another, a few things that I find as a minority and somebody who's an immigrant, I have the full intention of doing something good, but I may not be the best in writing the application, right? And I may not be the best in oral presentation. Um, and those consist of, what, 90, 90 points in, in, a, in a grant. If I've never had any experience in doing this, I don't have a you know, I don't have, you know, a staff that could help me put together brochures that's beautiful and presentable and, you know, eloquent. It is very difficult based on this process to get anywhere. Sure. So I, I like to see that somehow we could maneuver um, and put a certain aside to discover new um, organizations that want to participate, that want to become part of our city's um, you know, grant process, and to encourage more of these smaller organizations from coming, from coming forward instead of being so, you know, so frustrated or scared off. Sure, sure. Did I include your comments? Or? No. Okay, well. <laughs> and, I can certainly, and I can certainly, on behalf of the commission, I can uh, bring those sentiments back, but I can also assure you that those are sentiments mirrored in uh, by our commissioners and in our discussions as we evaluate this process every year. Uh, like you, I'm an immigrant. English is my second language. As you can tell, I'm not equipped with public speaking. And so the process, but as we evaluate this process every year, uh, for reference, you have to understand that um, some of our limitations is that 
we have nine members, volunteer members who serve on the commission. We do not actually interface with the organization prior to the written application. And that is for the purpose of maintaining uh, equal access and a fair process. We don't want the process to be influenced by familiarity or personal relationships of certain commissioners with certain organizations. And so to in, in um, assure fairness, we do not um, engage with the organization as commission members on behalf of this process ahead of the written application. Now that being said, will we be very happy and willing to explore ways? Of course, but I do want the council members to understand the pragmatism of getting under corn rules, getting nine commissioners together when applications will range up to 30 applicants per year and, um, and being able to get them in front of uh, the applicants to get to know them. And it's really by the limitations of kind of our setup and our resources that we are so reliant upon um, the written application. And again, I utilize the, um, the analog of the SATs. No one is saying that the, an that the SAT is a perfect proxy for evaluating the future prospects and talents of a child. But for scalability purposes, for assurance of fairness, transparency, that is the best we've got so far. I, I understand. I just think that that process really does um, harm and hurt those um, nonprofit organizations who are starting up because the older ones, they all, they all know your process. They, they know how to get through it. They know how to do the written applications. They got people working on it. It's sure. the smaller ones that we really want to explore. And I think that's the part that I'm, I'm having a little concern about, this blindfolded survey or blindfolded way of looking at um, applicants and grants. That, sure. That's all. And I'd like to have some way of resolving that problem. That, that is definitely a problem we'll, we'll for uh, solution. Uh, now, I, I'm going to start the regular meeting. I appreciate it. We'll, if you don't mind, we're, yeah. we'll start the regular meeting and bring this uh, item back shortly. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a recess and return after we've started the regular meeting. So I now declare the Plano City Council is reconvened in open session, that all members are present. We'll begin tonight's regular meeting with the invocation led by Bob Knowles, Senior Pastor at the Willowbin Church, and the Pledge of Allegiance and Texas Pledge, led by the Boy Scout Troop 259 with Charter Organization 12 Point Impact at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton Catholic Church. Would you all please rise? Yeah. Good job. All right, let's pray. Father God, we come before you now and we just humble ourselves before you and we ask your guidance and your wisdom on all matters that will be covered today. Father, sometimes our issues get complex and uh, they're not easy to sort out. And so, Father, I just pray um, that you would guide us uh, by your spirit. God, that, that, that discussions can be done with patience and understanding and God, that, uh, that decisions would be such that, that bring about justice, but also do not uh, lose sight of mercy. And so, Father God, um, uh, all of us here will do the best that we can, but we seek you in these moments. Thank you, God, for this city, for the state, and uh, the opportunity to serve one another. And uh, may your son Jesus... Um, be an example for us all on how to love and to give and to sacrifice. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.
the absolute. Please join me in the text or in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm sorry. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please join me in the Texas Pledge. On the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Two. Be seated. How are we gonna do this? <laughs> this is a huge room. And you guys, yeah, I'm not gonna figure it out. You can squeeze over here. Okay. Do we have, can we go down here? Yes, it will just be a little too much if I can do it. You know how that works. You know how that works. Okay. <laughs> But look at these guys, they're taller than me. <laughs> Man. Okay. I know, I'm going to have to get on the stool. <laughs> yeah, everybody get in there. You're too Chanel, you've got to come up front. I, I, I see what you're doing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, speaking of big groups, <laughs> we're thrilled to have the National Volunteer Week proclamation. And I'd like to call uh, Karina Sadler, Volunteer Resource Supervisor, Morgan Green Griffin, Volunteer Resource Coordinator, Andrew Fortune, Director of Policy and Government Relations, and all of you that are here tonight, we're indeed proud of you. Hold on just a second. <laughs> I'm going to read the proclamation very quickly, and then we're going to take a big picture. This is National Volunteer Week. Whereas Volunteers in Plano engages volunteers representative of the rich diversity of our community, from scouts to older adults, from lifelong residents to new arrivals, all who participate in service to better Plano. And whereas volunteers enhance services provided to City of Plano residents and extend capacity of city departments. And whereas 7,521 dedicated volunteers serve 67,000 hours with the City of Plano in 2022, and whereas Volunteers in Plano celebrates the 40th anniversary and remains a model municipal volunteer program across the country, whereas National Volunteer Week takes place each year to celebrate the impact of volunteer service and the power of volunteers to tackle society's great ca uh, challenges, to build stronger communities and be a force that transforms the world. Now, therefore, I, John Munns, mayor of the city of Plano, Texas, do hereby proclaim April 17th through the 21st, 2023 as National Volunteer Week in Plano 
And I also extend special recognition to all City of Plano volunteers and the 40th year legacy of volunteers in Plano. I do therefore encourage citizens to join me and the Plano City Council in honoring and thanking all who volunteer, especially the City of Excellence. Congratulations. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for being here. You could hear the buzz as we <laughs> joined you tonight. Um, we have some amazing volunteers. Those with us tonight in the blue shirts represent that 7,500 uh, different neighbors, friends from the business community, faith organizations, civic clubs uh, who choose to serve. And not everybody makes that choice. Uh, Morgan and I see that at VIP every day. Those who do call us and email us are making a choice to serve their city. And for that, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so here's what we're going to do. We usually take the picture this way. We're taking it that way. So everybody stand up. I, and you guys need to come, come get in the picture. I, I see the T-shirts. You can't, you can't avoid them. Can, can you guys? Either way, I mean, I, we're, we're going to get you. Let's get, let's get right here. Let me put this up. Do you guys want to come in? Come on. No? You just leave me hanging. Come on, come on, come on. Yeah? Okay. All right. All right. Half shot. All right. Does that all work? Thank you so much. Okay. So the Plano Fire Rescue has received reaccreditation from the Commission on the Fire Accreditation International. CFI, CFAI, right? Yeah. Okay, that, that's kind of a tongue twister. So we have our chief, Chris Biggerstaff, assistant chief, Jed Moverly, Jeff Moverly, budget analyst, Stephanie Saylor, and budget analyst, Heather Schwan. Once again, Plano Fire and Rescue has once again earned re-accreditation from CFAI. I was, I'm going to let the chief say a few words. Thank you. The CFAI, our Commission on Fire Accreditation International, is the gold standard for accreditation in the fire service. And so since 2001, Plano Fire Rescue has uh, had that accreditation. And so after 22 years of doing reaccreditation, you would think it would get easier as you went along, but it, that's not the case. They would probably tackle me if I said it was easy. Um, but it, it doesn't get easier because it's, it's based on constant improvement. And so in order to go through the process, you, you, they look at you and they say, are you, are you what you say you are? And they look at every piece of it. And then they also look from the past five years. That's how often you do the accreditation. They say, did you make the improvements that you said you would? And so there's, just a, there's a lot of time and effort that goes into it. I was going to talk about the number of hours, but I couldn't top the 67,000 hours that, uh, that our volunteers had uh, done. So, uh, But I, it's a department-wide uh, project, but this team right here are – they're the ones who carried the weight, carried us across the finish line. And so uh, just want to say thank you to them publicly uh, for all the work that, uh, that you've done to get us there. Thank you. Thank you. Come on in here. We got to take pictures, okay. you know that. All right. All right. Yes, sir. Come on, guys. Let's... I appreciate it. And finally, I'd like to call forward uh, Karen Balesa. Did I say it right, Karen? 
and issue the oath of office for the Board of Adjustment? Not today. It's just you. Uh, you did it together. I served on the Community oh. Commission, so shout out. Well, welcome. Welcome, and welcome to the Board of Adjustment. I'm going to uh, read the oath of office for you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will faithfully execute the duties of the Board of Adjustment of the City of Plano, State of Texas, and will, to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution and laws of the United States and of this state and the charter and ordinances of the city? And you therefore solemnly swear that you have not directly or indirectly paid, offered, or promised to pay contributed nor promised to contribute any money or valuable thing or promised any public office or employment as a, resort, uh, as a reward to secure your appointment, so help you God. You do. <laughs> Thank you. That's a lot to ask, right? Lot to ask. Thank, Thank you so you much. You So I didn't, uh, we didn't get the opportunity to remove a mo uh, an item on the consent agenda, but I will move. We don't have any comments of public interest, so I'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, and we'll, we'll do that, and then we'll go back to the, uh, the rest of the POM. Motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. You ready? Lisa? Okay. I have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Please vote. Motion passes eight to zero. All right. We're, we're going to move back to uh, item four on the preliminary open meeting and continue the discussion. Um, Councilmember Riccadelli, I think you had a, yes. a question or comment, and then I'll get to you, Councilman Grady. Thank, oh. thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, so, oh, thank you. Um, so, first of all, uh, Commissioners, uh, Chairman Singh, I just want to thank you for the uh, the work that you and the CRC do. Uh, I know you get a lot of applications and put a ton of work into reviewing them and getting resources to excellent nonprofits that serve the Plano community. So I think y'all are doing a great job of that. Um, similar to uh, some of the points that Deputy Mayor Pro Tem 2 raised, um, some of the questions in the rubric, and I don't know if this is intended, but some of them read almost as if this was in part a writing competition or a public speaking competition. Uh, you know, and as a, a former high school debater in our Plano schools, I can certainly appreciate, you know, a good public speaking competition, um, you know, moot court that, you know, you write a brief and get graded on that oral argument, get graded on that. But I, I don't think that's really what y'all are going for, but it kind of comes across that way from the questions. I, I assume, and, and, I, and, and I hope, and I believe this is the case, that y'all are looking for organizations that have excellence in substantively delivering services to those who need them, you know, not just those who did the best in the application process. Obviously, the application process is how you get the information that enables you to determine, um, you know, uh, who is best serving Plano residents. But, you know, I assume if you know, if, if the content of an application blows you away, you know, but the grammar's not good, there's a run-on sentence, you know, um, that's not what y'all are, are, are looking at. And I guess, um, you know, some of, the, some of the questions that I would highlight that, that, that may be giving organizations that, uh, that impression, uh, you know, we, we got the rubric and I went through and highlighted some things. You know, the first one obviously says application quality, you know, which was 10 points. And then I noted that 
you know, question four, ability to serve Plano residents, which really is what it's all about, right? Who, who's sure. best serving Plano residents is listed as only being worth five points, you know, which is less than the quality of the application itself. Then if you look at seven, you know, did the speaker effectively answer the public hearing questions in the allotted time? That's five points. Number eight, was the speaker able to effectively answer staff questions in the allotted time? Also five points. Was the speak number 10, was the speaker able to clearly answer commission questions? Uh, that's five points. You know, was the speaker knowledgeable? That's number 11, that's five points. And number 12, did the public presentation content match or enhance the content presented in the written application? Uh, that's five points as well. And, and, and you know, I'm assuming, especially because I've, you know, y'all have been making recommendations to us for, you know, for all the years I've been on council. I, I know what y'all are really looking for is the organizations that are making the biggest impact in the Plano community to, to do, you know, these valuable social services in the community. <clears throat> but reading, reading this application, if I was, you know, to Mayor Pro Tem Prince's, you know, question about potentially a new applicant thinking, is this a process that I want to get involved in? I might think that it's almost uh, form over substance. So I just wanted to, to highlight that, you know, to, maybe there's a way to say, you know, your application and your, your uh, public hearing presentation are how we're determining who's delivering the best uh, services to Plano residents, but not have so many questions that focus on, you know, how well did you do at writing and speaking and maybe sure. questions that, that, that really dig down to the meat of, you know, who's doing the best job, you know, as reflected in the application and the presentation, who's doing the best job of serving Plano residents. So anyway, that just that's what jumped out at me from reading it. And, you know, I think that might enhance uh, understanding of what y'all are really looking for and what you're really evaluating. And so I want to end where I started, which is thank you so much for the incredibly valuable work that y'all do and the hours and hours y'all put in on this. Sure. So. And just to just to assure you, there is uh, the, I want there to be no doubt that there is no preponderance of self-importance in the way that we structure the scoring system. And, um, and just to be clear, but, but we, 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 I definitely empathize with how the feedback that we can work on the copy, the diction of how we um, word these criteria. But um, I also wanna assure you that um, this is what you see up top is really just a, a streamlined version, the headlines of the categories. The, the overall rubric that gets sent out to the, to the uh, uh, organizations, applicants, they do have the subtext. They have general subtext that's included in the memorandum that's distributed by Lori previous to this meeting. There is a, more of an explanation, more of a context of what we're looking for. Um, but again, to, to, to the wise words of Charlie Munger, um, sometimes it's uh, you, uh, incentive drives desire behavior. And as I explained previously, we really have, as the CRC, we have two touch points with these organizations, the written application and the public meetings, public presentations where the applicants come in, in front of us. And really to incentivize to, for them to come, we put a waiting a score, scoring system on how they present. But again, we, I will certainly take the feedback back to our commission that we can better word and better message what we're going after. Well, thank you for being open to that feedback, and I certainly understand the need to communicate the vital importance of, of applicants putting their best foot forward in both the written application and the presentation, because that's all the information that you guys have. Uh, the only other thing that I wanted to, to ask you about was, you know, I, I've been involved in judging using rubrics, and sometimes, you know, you say, okay, four out of five on this, eight out of 10 on that, you know, and you add it up, and at the end, you think, you know, wait a minute, this, this one added up to more than that one, but I, re I really I really think that one was actually better or more valuable. I guess a two-part question there, have you had that experience on the CRC? And and then secondly, if you have, what do y'all do about that? You know, if, if after, you know, kind of compartmentalizing it into all of these, you know, compartmentalized scores, if you're like, wait, that didn't yield the result that, that intuitively I thought it should. Well, certainly from a... Um from a personal sentiment basis, there's certainly, there's gonna be times where I, um, a organization applicant that I scored higher averaged to a lower score on behalf of the commission. 
Um, and so that, that certainly happens. And, but I will say that we, in our deliberations and discussion amongst the commissioners each year as we review this process, we are uh, basically, um, we're prioritizing the integrity of the process. Being able to say, hey, this is, we're gonna outline in front of the organization ahead of the process that this is the, this is the mechanism by which we are going to make the recommendation to city council for the uh, grant proceeds. Now, if it's the mandate and the feedback from the council that we should take more of a direct approach, we, we can certainly evaluate that. Um, as I mentioned previous, previous to 2018, um, CRC simply evaluated the written application, had the public hearings and public presentations of the <clears throat> applicants, and they got together in a room and they, they simply negotiated and discussed the dollar amounts to be rewarded. And there, there is certainly positives to that process. So we're certainly open to feedback. Sure. Well, I appreciate the attention to, you know, to, to doing this in, a, in an impartial way. And I'm not necessarily saying that should change. I just wondered, you know, if, you know, if there were ever circumstances where the CRC members felt like, like there, there was too high of a level of, I guess, rigidity, you know, in the numerical scores versus you know, things that may not be captured in, in those categories. I just wanted to highlight that for your consideration. But again, I just want to say thank you so much for the extremely important work y'all are doing in the community and for the hours and hours that y'all dedicate uh, to this as, as community volunteers. So thank you. Councilmember Grady. If I may, I'd like Councilmember Williams and then I'll oh. have my own questions. All right, Councilmember Williams. Well, thank you, and uh, thank you, Chairman Singh. And uh, for the record, I think you're doing a credible job of public speaking. Um, <clears throat> so uh, my question touches on what both Deputy Mayor Pro Tem and Councilman Riccadelli uh, said. For, so it seems very heavily weighted toward the written portion, but I understand you're trying to get at the actual um, meet, the actual understanding of what this organization can do. But um, are you, and have you, can you, I should say, during the public hearing, adjust the written score based on information that comes to light in the public hearing. So to, pres to come up with a hypothetical example, uh, the financial uh, ability or financial status of the organization is worth 15 points in the written portion. Um, so if maybe they didn't understand the rubric well, or they didn't think, or they answered a question that wasn't asked, or they omitted a piece of information that came to light in the public hearing, so they didn't score as well during the written portion, but during the public hearing you're like, oh, well, I wish I'd known that in the written portion. Can you go back and adjust those scores to reflect that information? So the short answer is that we have not done that. Okay. But also to your point, we have uh, commission members have brought up the exact point you brought up. What if in a situation we discovered things in the public presentation that is different from what we read in the written application? And one adjustment that we made over the course of uh, these past two years is if you look at the rubric criteria for public hearing, um, there is five points that were rewarded on the basis of, basis of did the public presentation content match or enhance the application content. So that is a, uh, a value system to say, hey, uh, if we discover things that are in the public hearing that is in contradiction to what we re reviewed in the written application, then that should warrant a lower score of those five points. And to, to, to your point about the written application things we discover, our, our philosophy and our discussion conclusion has been, hey, we want the organization to put the best foot forward on the written application. It seems a little bit unfair to the intent of equal access to a fair process if we were to allow for a certain organization to come to the public hearing and say, hey, 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 wait, let's uh, we didn't spend enough time on the written application. Let's revise the presented due diligence documents or the facts that was uh, presented in the written application. So that is kind of the issue that we're trying to engineer away with our process and our adherence to the integrity of process with the written application. Okay, that's fair. And I was thinking more so not where there's a conflict of information presented in the public hearing versus the written application, but where something additional comes to light. Um, have, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yes, and, and that's if, if it's something additional, and um, I, I, we feel that, again, to uh, acknowledge the feedback from um, um, Council Member Riccadelli, we can do a better job with the copy and diction of how we present the criteria for the public hearing, but that 
a lot of that criteria is meant to award organizations for enhancing written application. Okay. Yes. And to your goal of trying to get people to come to the public hearing, have you considered weighting the public hearing portion a little more heavily than it is currently? We, we have considered that. We, and, and that's, again, that's something that's uh, um, deliberated on every year. But I can share with you in the past five years since the rubric has been adopted, the written application has more weighted because, again, we wanted, uh, we feel that the, uh, the competency and the financial wherewithal of organization is static at that point in time. It shouldn't change based on the presentation and the ability to, of, a, of the public speaker. And that's, that's coming from someone who's not a natural public speaker, so I can completely empathize with that, with that sentiment of our commission. But that's, that's why, historically, we weighted the written application more than the public hearing. Okay. Well, still doing an incredible job. And thank you, Chairman. Thank you for your service. Councilmember Brady. Thank you. Um, I just had a few questions I wanted to make sure, because I had some of the same issues with the rubric, and I'll, I'll mention sure. them in a minute. But it specifically says in the document um, that the application process and what we're trying to achieve um, is that the application is consistent with the city's consolidated plan on housing and community development needs. Um, have you read that plan? Which the, the consolidated the, plan for the city? Not recently, but I have. Okay, have the other have the other um, uh, commissioners read that plan? That hasn't been the we have been uh, as part of the training that um, plan has been reviewed with the commission. Okay, because I was just wondering. I have the plan here; it's 266 pages long. Um, so enjoy the reading. It's a it's a very thorough document, um, but it's extremely detailed and very thick. The concern that I have is that an applicant that is going to apply for this, there's no link on the site on this application process to find this document. Um, I had to search for it myself because in the application itself, as it exists on the website, there is no way that I can, as an applicant, find this particular document. And it says that your application is based on this document for which the commissioners are going to weigh whether or not your application fulfills the need of the consolidated plan and the annual action plan, um, which is another 58 pages added onto that piece of reading. Um, and so if it's the concern that I have is that if they can't find these documents, they can't fill out the application correctly so they can be evaluated correctly so that it fulfills the requirements that the city needs. And so that's, that's the, the first concern that I saw within the document. Um, and so I wanted to pass that on so that you know where I was coming from as far as uh, a concern uh, with, the, with the process in and of itself. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on, and, and many of the uh, council members, my peers, have touched on that, certainly has been the, um, the rubric itself. And the rubric basically says, um, as, as has been discussed, most of it is on the written application, and then a, a, another significant portion on it is the presentation. Um, a lot of these uh, nonprofits are extremely good at delivering services into the community. They have a heart in the community. They know what's happening. They know what's happening to the people that they serve and, and how, they, how they need to provide those services. They may not be the greatest performer in the world. Um, and they may not be the greatest author in the world. Um, and so the caution that I have is, is that if it is strictly on how well they wrote a document or how well they performed in front of you or how well they answered your question or the staff's question in a subjective manner um, doesn't mean that they're, they're unable to deliver those services in the community where they can really deliver the services in the community, but they're not a great public speaker and they're not a great writer. Um, and so I, I think that needs to be taken in consideration, especially as uh, Council Member Riccadelli pointed out, that question number four is the ability to serve Plano residents, which should be the key to everything that we're doing, is only five points out of 100. Um, and so I, I, I looked at that and circled that one, and I circled also Number 14, which is the consolidated plan outcomes. Are we delivering to the consolidated plan outcomes? 
Um, and so what I did is I went through, and I, I actually did read this, by the way, um, and I made some notes within the annual action plan, which I thought were um, of importance. And I wanted to point that out to you as well, you and, and the staff, so that you knew um, where my thoughts were. Um, primarily, there are seven goals within the annual action plan, which syncs with the consolidated plan. Um, and they're defined fairly, fairly specifically. Um, housing rehabilitation, home ownership, supply of units, um, homelessness prevention, homelessness sheltering and services, public services and special needs, and then finally, grant administration. Um, and so I wanted to dig through that just a little bit from the standpoint that if I was to take a look at the annual action plan, which is how well we've done so far, um, we are now in the 20 to 24 um, consolidated plan in year three. Um, we've already passed 20, 21, and 22, so we've entered actually, I guess, year four. You could count it as year four, but th we're not that deep into it. Um, we've had some, what I would call, accomplishments, but I don't know if we're getting to the goals that we've actually set up. And so the concern that I have is, is are we getting the right dollars to the right people to accomplish the goals um, as we talk about the rubric and being able for it to satisfy uh, wh what our needs are. So when I start taking a look at some other things that I think are important to understand is when we administer the plan, um, we actually, in the Community Development Block Grants, or as we all acronymically say, CDBG funds, um, we have the ability to maximize a, what I call a carve off of that of 20%, and that is used for grant administration. Um, that adds up to about $285,000 somewhere in there. In, if you look at the other six goal areas that we're working on to achieve, we've really only in the past couple of years lent out dollars to five different organizations. And if you add up the CDBG funds that we put out to those five different organizations, it came up to $272,000. So I'm sitting here thinking we're, we're administering using $285,000 to administer five grants for a total of $272,000, other than our own work internally. So housing rehab we do internally, and it, and it says specifically in the document that we do that. Housing rehab is all, all administered through 777 East 15th, which is one of our buildings right down the street. So the concern that I have when we administer CDBG funds is getting money out into the community. And if we're using 285 or 282,000 to administer 272,005 grants, I wonder how much we're getting out the street. See where I'm going with that? Yes, and uh, in response for a big part, you know, we, we mirror your sentiments and perhaps, uh, you know, your concerns about the allocation of CDBG and the home funds. Um, from, from personal experience and observation, mm -hmm. I think a big part of that is top of the funnel issue. There's not very many applicants that come to the city for uh, the CDBG funds and the home funds for very reasons. And one reason that's been shared by me, to me by many of the organizations is simply um, the, the restrictions of the federal requirements of those funds are uh, prohibited for them to utilize those funds or not worthwhile. So I, I don't have a solution. I'm open to a solution, but I definitely um, empathize with the problem that you've identified with those funds. Okay, and I, I think I'm glad that you mentioned that because I think it's important for us to reach out in the community and find people that can use those funds. Um, I think that our staff um, better utilization sometimes is not doing housing rehab. I mean, I'm going to be real honest. Um, lots of other things, a lot of important things that need to be done, 
we don't need to be a housing rehab general uh, general uh, contractor. And, and so I, I'm a little bit concerned about that. So those, those are my major concerns is the rubric itself, 90% of it doesn't address what I say is getting dollars out on the street and boots on the ground. Um, and then the funding. So that's, those are the, my points. I know that the, the um, council members brought up others. Um, I, I totally agree with them um, that we're not really looking at the true deliverable substance, um, which is how much are we actually doing for the people that are out there in the community. I understand what's happening with the CDBG and the home funds and how it has some restrictions to it. I think we need to really take a look at that. Sure. Um, and from a commission standpoint, that would be a charge that I would give you is we need to really take a look at that because if our drive, if our guide is this consolidated plan and the annual action plan, and we expect the people that are applying for this to read these two documents and understand them so that we can grade them on their, their applications on how well they're doing the delivery. And then we take a look at the score that's in their annual action plan on how well we've done in the past three years. I don't think they match up to what we really want to be doing. Sure. Now, Councilman uh, Grady, just so I can mitigate some of your concerns in terms of the rubric on the, on the written application uh, component, your concern about directing uh, proceeds and evaluation, the, the, the weighted value to uh, priority needs within the city. Um, of course, we have the project description they need, and yes, that is, that is only 10 points, but um, the way perhaps the mistake that or, or the area of uh, refinement that we can take is that our intention for that is that it's to be matched with the capacity to manage program, ability to serve residents, and proposed outcome measures. Um, the idea is that the project description in need is just an idea, and there's a, there's a, there's a thought process in your own business. The idea is not worth a million dollars. It's the competency and the execution. So when paired with capacity to manage program, ability to serve perennial residents and propose outcome measures, we're talking about awarding 35 of the maximum 60 points on a written application to really uh, our evaluation of an organization's ability to both have the identified idea to uh, the project need, but also to execute. So I, again, I know we, this, is, this is the fifth year that we've had this rubric, mm -hmm. and this is frankly the first time we had this explicit feedback, and we welcome it because we thought we were doing good, but we can do better. And so we, we will certainly, I will take, certainly take these sentiments back to the commission, and we can refine the wording and perhaps how we group these uh, criteria measures. Good, because uh, I appreciate that. I think that the, the, the important thing is the outcomes, because that is what we have stated within the application process is the biggest concern that we have is the outcomes, but our scorecard doesn't indicate we're accomplishing our outcomes. So when I see that the scorecard is not accomplishing our, uh, what we said our outcomes need to be, I start going back through the process to find out where the issues are, and that's where I'm finding them. Yes. Thank, thank you. Councilman Smith? Thank you very just quickly, and, and just to follow up, I also agree, I think you do a fine job of public speaking, don't cut yourself short. Um, well, one thing I'd like to suggest, and, and a lot of it been, has been said, but uh, I think in, in, with uh, Mayor Pro Tem's point and, and uh, Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor Pro Tem both, we, we do need to have a track for, let's call it first timers, okay, a be beginner's track. It, because just for example, I mean, there's there one group that's actually right down the street from us here, uh, Hope Restored Mission, I know I've, I've helped them with some things. I asked them once, I said, you guys really need to apply, you know, for the for grant process to get some assistance. They, they, they help, you know, homeless, homeless prevention and people that are homeless and help them, you know, get back on their feet. And they said, we, we're, just, we're too small. We, we don't have anybody that can write this thing, you know. Uh, so that happens. And, and I think if we had a, a track, a separate category, as we're doing all this, a separate set aside for first-time applicants, it would kind of be an equal footing. 
you know, yes, everybody might do a crappy written thing, but they're all going to do the crappy written thing. So they're on they're on equal ground. They're not competing against people that do this every year and get grants and get funds because they do it every year. They know how to do it. So that's what I'd recommend. And let, let's let's do that set aside there. And, and yes, I think Councilman Gray had great points. You know, pay attention to the rubrics because Councilman Rick Daly pointed this out. It's all about serving the citizens, serving the people in need. If we're not ensuring the best way for that to happen, we are not doing the right job. And I think that's why we're all here tonight because we recognize we have to do a better job at delivering. Get, it does no good to get the money if we can't get it out to the people that are in need. So, but let's let's definitely let's look at doing a separate track for first-time applicants and, and putting that in place. That's that would be I think very helpful for us. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Appreciate appreciate you. Thank you. Items for individual consideration. Did you want to see if there's any future agenda items or future discussion on oh, agenda sure. items? And we'll finish Sorry. off the POM. Yeah, on the POM, uh, are there any items for uh, action on future agendas or discussion? Okay. Items for individual consideration. Public hearing items. Applicants are limited to 15 minutes presentation time with a five minute rebuttal if needed. Remaining speakers are limited to 30 total minutes of testimony time with three minutes assigned per speaker. The presiding officer may amend these times as deemed necessary. Non-public hearing items. The presiding officer will permit public comment for items on the agenda not posted for a public hearing. The presiding officer will establish time limits based upon the number of speaker requests, the length of the agenda, and to ensure meeting efficiency, and may include a cumulative time limit. Speakers will be called in the order the requests are received until the cumulative time is exhausted. Item number one. Public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning case 2023-001 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended, granting specific use permit number 67 for Martial Arts Studio on point one acre of land located on the south side of Capitol Avenue, 800, or 684 feet east of N Avenue in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, presently zoned Light Industrial 1, directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Hello again, Mayor, Council, and Executives. I am Christina Day, the Director of Planning. Um, so we have a zoning case before you. It is the first 2023 zoning case and it is a request for a specific use permit for a martial arts studio in the light industrial area of uh, East Plano at Capitol Avenue near uh, N Avenue. So you can see the location. It is, a, again, a lease space, so that's why it's internal to the lot because it is a part of a building. And the notice area, uh, 200 foot and 500 foot indicated on the screen. So this is an aerial photograph of where this would be located within the building. And uh, you can see how the building faces Capitol Avenue. So the subject property is part of the Employment Center's designation on the future land use map. And this uh, request is consistent with that designation. It is classified as retail types, which would not change the land use mix in this area. So as you can see in this summary, it, the request meets the description and priority. Uh, there's no change to the mix of uses and the other items are not really applicable because there's no changes to the physical site. So with that, we have one response. We had a, a letter from an adjacent property owner within 200 feet, they're neutral to the request. And then we had a number of other uh, feedback, three total feedback uh, responses with one in support and two neutral citywide. So with that, the Planning and Zoning Commission is uh, 
unanimously in support of this item, and I'm glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Christine. Any questions for staff? Thanks. I'll open the public hearing. Are there any speakers? The only speaker we have on this item is the applicant. Okay. Would the applicant like to? Uh... Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. <clears throat> Hi, I'm, I'm Tracy Dickey, and I'm a, a resident of Murphy, but I have two businesses here in, in Plano. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my school. Uh, it's Texas Ishinru Karate Kai of East Plano, where a tr traditional Okinawa karate. I have been in the Plano community in that area for over 15 years subleasing space. Throughout this time, I've been located with several different gymnastic schools along Summit Avenue, but most recently the Flip Factory um, on Summit. Our program includes martial arts classes for students of all abilities and ages up to four and up. Um, our classes are, are self-defense training in local charities, including Emily's Place, New, Begin uh, uh, New Beginnings, Hope Store, and Treasured Vessels um, Foundation, where I volunteer. We, um, we provide self-defense seminars for high school students, college students, Girl Scouts troops, um, and teachers, etc. And in lieu of fees, I donate all that money to Hope Store or Treasured Vessels. More than four out of five of our students attend with another family mother, whether a parent or a sibling. We provide an adaptive program for students with physical and mental disabilities, and 20% of our stu students are on scholarship too, so they can continue their training. To remain within the same area of Plano that we have been in, we're looking to open up the facility at 1506 Capitol. This location is central to our current students and their families, as well as providing traditional martial arts school within the central Plano area. The space is ideal size for having a workout area, changing rooms, restrooms, the office, and a lobby for the parents. Our location is nestled among other athletic facilities on Summit Avenue, Avenue N, Plano Parkway, such as volleyball, cricket, cheerleading, jiu-jitsu, and basketball. With most of our classes being held in the evening and weekends, there is little impact on the other tenants. With our own facility, we're able to expand our outreach to the local community, offer more classes tailored towards specific needs student, students with challenges, provide additional self-defense seminars to local businesses and community members, and increase our volunteering with under, um, underserved members of the community, which I'd like to get involved with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Plano. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll close the public hearing, confine the comments to the council. Motion to approve. Second. Thank you. I have a motion <clears throat> and a second uh, to approve uh, agenda item number one. Any comments? Please vote. Motion passes. Thank you. Next item. Item number two, public hearing and consideration of an ordinance as requested in zoning <clears throat> case 2022-18 to amend the comprehensive zoning ordinance of the city, ordinance number 2015-5-2 as heretofore amended. <clears throat> so as to rezone 5.2 acres of land located on the west side of J Place 111 feet north of State Highway 190 in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, from Lake Commercial to Plan Development 57 Corridor Commercial and rescind specific use permits 525 and 529 for contract construction, number 526 and 528 for auto storage, and 527 and 530 for used car dealer. Presently zoned light commercial with specific use permits, 525 and 529 for contract construction, 526 and 528 auto storage, and number 527 and 530 for used car dealer. Directing a change accordingly in the official zoning map of the city, providing a penalty clause, a repealer clause, a savings clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. All right, this next case, zoning case 2022-18, is a request to rezone 5.2 acres 
on the southern boundary of the K Avenue corridor. It's actually located on J Place. And the request is to create a plan development district. The plan development district uh, better allows this property to comply with the comprehensive plan standards. Um, so moving forward, you can see the existing properties today via aerial photograph uh, and the surrounding land uses in the area. Um, the subject property is highlighted in yellow and it is surrounded primarily by commercial uses uh, to the north and to the east. Uh, there is some vacant property to the south and a multifamily residential development to the west across the DART light rail line. State Highway 190 is also to the south. So this is a concept plan that was submitted along with the development package. It is not attached to the plan development stipulation, so there could be some modifications to the site as it moves through the development process, but this is an example of what could develop uh, with the uh, plan development stipulations that are proposed. There are two buildings proposed. The property is bisected east-west, roughly in the middle, uh, by a, water, a North Texas Municipal Water District easement, so uh, hence the, the two buildings in that separation uh, that's being used as a connection through the property. So a little bit about the zoning history of this property. Um, prior to 2003, it was zoned light industrial, and it still contains industrial type uses. Um, hence, also, all of the specific use permits that would be rescinded were this case approved. Um, things like used car dealership and contract construction are currently allowed here uh, because of that previous light industrial zoning. The city initiated rezoning of this area because of changes to the corridor back in 2003. And at that time, the property was changed to light commercial and those SUPs were put in place. So a similar zoning case was submitted uh, previously in 2001, but uh, went through a couple of review cycles and were withdrawn. That case was withdrawn. It did not, was, there was no public hearing. So this is what the comprehensive plan shows on the future land use map. It is within the downtown corridors future land use category. And so the comprehensive plan analysis, I want to spend a few minutes on this because, uh, as you can see, there are some details there. Um, this, it does meet the description and priorities of the downtown corridor. Um, the mix of uses uh, are not exactly aligned. Uh, the mix has 92.8% multifamily today, and the alignment with the mix is 0 to 90%. Uh, Character-defining elements. Though there are quite a few of those that meet. However, there are, is some city council direction needed on the applicability of transit-oriented development because density in the downtown corridor depends on whether it's tr considered transit-oriented development. There was information on that in the staff report. Planning and zoning did find it was transit-oriented development. Um, so that's uh, yet to be seen this evening. Uh, the thoroughfare plan map, Bike transportation map and parks master plan map are all in conformance um, with this request. The expressway corridor environmental health map, there are some concerns there. Um, there is mitigation proposed, however. Redevelopment of regional transportation corridors policy, that requires compliance with the future land use map. So because of the mix of uses issue, that, is, um, that creates a concern with that policy. Um, that's similar to concerns on RGM-1 and RGM-8. And then, um, again, pending the TOD applicability for the transit-oriented development policy and downtown vision and strategy update. But I would also like to point out that RGM Action 8 does, there is some conformance there if you find it to be transit-oriented development. So I know that was a lot, but we will move on. <laughs> All right, so here is the uh, environmental health area map. So you can see this is located uh, in the EHA2 area that states that um, sensitive land uses are generally inappropriate, but may be uh, 
utilized if satisfactory mitigation is achieved. So I think that's what we're looking for here um, is the mitigation. There are mitigation measures proposed for both noise and pollution in the plan development stipulations. So the question of is this transit-oriented development, the future land use map does not include the Bush Station. However, the uh, downtown uh, plan does incorporate the, down, the Bush D Dart Station. So there comes the policy kind of conflict that you can wrestle with. Um, it is within walking distance to the Bush Dart Station at approximately 1,000 feet. And so future residents would be able to have a direct pedestrian connection across State Highway 190 by a proposed trail connection. Um, the Planning and Zoning Commission did find this to be transit-oriented development, and the comprehensive plan does support uh, that type of development within walking distance of light rail stations. So multifamily development in the PD is limited to 325 units on the site. They're utilizing the downtown business government zoning district standards for the type of multifamily development that you would see. So if that gives you an idea of the type of uh, design that you would see there, both unit size, parking, uh, the standards that are utilized in the PD are, are based on that zoning district. Um, there are some adjacency issues to the north and the south, the south primarily being the highway, um, the north being some existing land uses there with uh, gar garage doors facing the site. Those are, again, addressed through the PD stipulations. There's some landscape screening requirements that have been included. And um, there are also site amenity requirements for the multifamily use that we hope bring some additional quality of life to future residents should the request be approved. So plan development stipulations also include EHA mitigation. So uh, pollution measures, including location for intakes for outdoor air, mechanical ventilation requirements, um, noise mitigation for using the parking structure as a buffer, uh, construction documents requiring interior noise mitigation, and balcony restrictions are all part of the plan development. With regard to open space, um, again, we're back to the is it a TOD <laughs> question. Uh, the TOD standard in the dashboard policy is 5 to 10 percent um, for the transit-oriented development. Um, and then for other areas, it's 10 to 20 percent. The proposal is closer to the non-TOD, but we think because of the buffers that are needed because of some adjacency that may be appropriate to make an exception in this area, even if you find it to be transit oriented. So residential standards, um, there is a setback from the northern property here, and um, that is helpful again to screen and buffer from those adjacent uses. There's a 10 foot landscape buffer, um, as well as a fencing. Uh, there's a five-foot landscape edge on the western property line. A, uh, along J Place, there's a number of pedestrian-oriented amenities that are very consistent with the future land use category to improve that area. Uh, pedestrian walkway, street trees, on-street parking, and then a nice connection to the existing trail along the dart line that is on the southern edge of the property. So with regard to feedback, um, we included two tables. Uh, we don't often get feedback from the property itself, but this time we did. We did not get responses from within the buffer, but we did get a response from a property owner. So that's where you see the one signed letter here representing two acres. And then other responses throughout uh, that we received, I uh, will say eight, um, two were duplicate responses, and two responses are from outside the city of Plano. Um, there were a total of 10 responses. So if you're looking for unduplicated Plano responses, your number is six. And there's a map of those locations. So the Planning and Zoning Commission did recommend approval with a vote of four in favor, one in opposition and one abstention. Um, this 
case does require findings due to the uh, RGM policy and the comprehensive plan. So with that, um, it would just be if you were voting to approve. And with that, I'm available for questions you might have on this mm -hmm. case. Okay. Thanks, Christina. Sure. Uh, do you have a question for staff? Mayor Pro Tem. On the undeveloped land right to the south, mm -hmm. how large is that space? I, we could look that up. Um, we've looked at it specifically of is it a developable piece of yeah. property? And I think there are significant challenges to developing that piece of property, but I think that it may require variances, but I do think that you could develop something. It would be something very small. Okay, so you don't have concerns with the two, there being incompatible zoning with one being residential and one remaining like commercial there? Um, I do not uh, think that's the most favorable condition, um, but I think there's a very limited there are very limited opportunities on that property. It would be my preference that that property were rezoned. So if this zoning case is approved, it may be something that the city wants to look at working with that property owner for rezoning. Okay, thank you. Rick Adele. Thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Christina, for that presentation. Um, there's been discussion about the various facets of the comprehensive plan with respect to this zoning case, and we've talked about how the comprehensive plan uh, generally supports uh, uh, TOD within walking distance of light rail stations. Um, my understanding, though, is it, it doesn't support an unlimited number of units. Uh, the, the dashboards still apply, and so that would be uh, under the comprehensive plan essentially the overriding consideration, right, TOD. Uh, uh, TOD uh, type development is, is favored within walking distance of, uh, of light rail stations, but the, the number of units, whether TOD, non-TOD, any kind of, of you know, uh, type of multifamily would still be subject to the dashboards, correct? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Councilman Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Christina, just to be sure I understand it, I, I, I watched the, the meeting and it, and it uh, uh, seemed like obviously everything turned out TOD recommendation. The, the one real stickler was the, the EHA 2 regulation, and, and if I'm remembering correctly, the, uh, the applicant, uh, and you may have mentioned that with going above building codes, but they, they were planning they're going to upgrade from a standard 6 MERV air filtration system to an 8 MERV. Is that... Yes. That's still still correct. That is part of the plan development stipulation, so they'll yep. be required to do that uh, under this zoning. And, and they are enhancing landscape, and putting additional trees and things in the area as well. That is correct. There are a number of additional landscape standards um, on uh, each frontage, from street trees on the street to every frontage requires some sort of lands additional landscaping. Yes, sir. Okay, and and do you? I mean, I've lived here thirty something years. I mean, that's been there as long as I can remember. Has, has that ever been anything besides what it is now? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I think the lumber yard has been there quite right. some time as well as the properties to the south. I believe that uh, ownership has not changed again uh, in decades, but I believe that uh, applicant may be able to address that more precisely. Okay. And then so on one the one side, you, you do have an apartment complex going. And then on the other side there, we have a, a, a uh, was it a Marriott Bonvoy Hotel? There's a hotel. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you, Christina. Yes, certainly. Thanks, Christina. Okay. Thank you. I'll open the public hearing. Uh, the only speakers we have on this item are the applicant, Adam Brown, and Connor Osborne. Come on up, guys. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Adam Brown, and I'm representing Trinsic Residential Group. Uh, so I'm the I'm the property developer. So we have the property under co contract. So uh, hopefully, we can answer some of the questions you guys had after we finish our presentation. But first, just want to thank staff for working with us. We've been working on this site for 
for well over a year now, and so just just appreciate them working through and checking as many boxes as we as we could along the way. Obviously, you know, just to start, we're excited. I mean, you can kind of see from the picture there. Uh, you know, we're excited about transforming. It's kind of a southern gateway site to Plano. Uh, you know, as this transformation, you know, starts really at the southern border with this site and goes north into downtown. So that that excites us. Uh, just briefly. Uh, who we are. Uh, so we are a DFW-based uh, regional multifamily group. Uh, I, I run uh, and oversee the Texas market. Uh, we've, we've been around for about 10 plus years. So we've done, you know, about 7,000 units in DFW, about 2,000 more in the pipeline. So, you know, we are local and experienced uh, developer that, you know, really pride ourselves on delivering quality product. Uh, you know, actually back in 2014, uh, you know, I actually rezoned the property just to the west. So Aura 190 was our project. We came before the city and rezoned that back in 2014. So we know the area. We kind of know that pocket. We know the challenges and the positives of that pocket. Uh, you know, that's really drawn us back to this area, to the site. You know, it's a unique site, similar to 190. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that here in a few minutes. But, you know, the geometry, easements, the challenges, you know, for other uses that really make make a you know great use of land for multifamily because we can really mold around different challenges. Oh, that's an old. Let me flip forward. This is the old presentation. Anyway, we can it's we can skip those. But so in the in the map here, I want to just give a little context. Obviously, everybody knows where the site is. Uh, it's a you know the the property outlined in red. Obviously there to the west is Aura 190, the project I was mentioning that we developed and built back in 2016. As you can see, we talked a lot about TOD. You know, you're a four minute walk to the south, uh, to the Richardson stop. You know, you're a 10 minute walk to the north, to the new 12th Street station. And obviously everybody knows about the Silver Line that's also being constructed, you know, that's just another note of transportation that really lends itself to the, being a TOD site. Uh, you know, you also note here the hike and bike trail along the DART, which is on our side of the property. So as staff mentioned, we'll have a direct connection to that so people can go north and south, you know, because I think, you know, as a focus of the city, you really want to get people out and about. And so, you know, we're, we're really feel good about that hike and bike trail and just the, the transportation that it allows people uh, to use that. Uh, one other thing I don't want to point out here, just from a land planning perspective, at least how I look at it as a developer. You know, if you look at the map when we were looking at 190, you really focus these multifamily uses in the inner core, you know, next to these transportation, transportation corridors. And then as you go east and west, as you get back to the you know 75 Avenue K, really the roads that are moving people north and south through the, through the area. That's really where I would see concentration of more of the commercial uses. So you know, in our eyes, we see this as a really great multifamily location. So the site today, uh, briefly talking on this, I think we talked. There's you know six SUPs on the site today: open storage, lumber yard, industrial uses. I think one of the questions, one of the owners on the south side, actually the two south tracks, this is a, this is a multi uh, property assemblage, but the two properties on the south, that property has been owned by the same family for, I don't know, 60 years. They built those buildings, uh, you know, so, you know, they're excited. You know, the only really feedback they've gotten over the years is multifamily. So, you know, they're really looking forward to seeing this transformation use uh, given the history on the site. Uh, you know, some of the challenges that, that she mentioned with the site, the site is bisected right in the middle. So it really challenges it to develop the site as a whole. But we're able to break the building up into two buildings, really create that pedestrian experience through there and use it as an advantage instead of a disadvantage. Uh, and then the property of the south, and I may, it's a little, it's actually on the, on the new slide, but the property of the south that somebody's mentioned, there's, there's three easements that bisect it. So we've studied it pretty closely too. I mean, it, I guess it could be developed, but I think there's about 0.2 acres that you can develop in the little center of the triangle, just given all the infrastructure that's going on. So we don't believe that'll be a negative use going forward. I, I don't 
personally don't see that being developed, uh, but we have addressed that with landscaping on that side. Uh, then we'll go more specific to our site plan and address a few of the issues with EHA and kind of see how our site is developed. But on the east side along JPI, as she mentioned, we have parallel parking, seven foot sidewalk, uh, you know, really another pedestrian way for people to get north and south to downtown, to south, just like the hike and bike trail on the west side. Uh, as she mentioned, our garage is on the south side to mitigate noise from 190. And also the south, what I'm calling the south block, so south of that easement, there are no balconies uh, facing east, west, or inside the, court, inside the courtyard. All balconies are in the north building are facing north on that B block. Uh, so that gives you a little idea how we're mitigating the noise issues. And just, you know, kind of a point of reference, we're still owners of the property next door. You know, we've owned it since 2006 when we opened it. We've never had any problems with any noise complaints or livability or anything. So that's just kind of a point uh, to make there. Uh, and you can kind of see on here, they're graphically shown, but the, the landscape buff from the north and south end. And just our last slide here, you know, wh why we think, you know, a redevelopment makes sense here, no single family adjacency, you know, the Southern Gateway, as I mentioned, you know, they were great uses 60 years ago, but today there's a better use for that Southern Gateway as you transition, you know, what the city wants to see going from the corridor going into downtown with all the new transit. And this, the site constraint. I mean, there's a, as we mentioned, there's a lot of site constraints. You know, the, the beauty about multifamily, we can work around those items. Um, you know, we mentioned, you know, just an assemblage, so it's just a lot of complexity there. But uh, Connor, you wanna speak a little bit about the comp plan here? Good evening, Connor Osborne with Trinsic as well. Um, just wanted to dive into the comp plan items in a little more detail, um, given that's the analysis we heard from planning. So um, over the last six months, we've, we've really worked hard with staff to, to tailor that PD that's in the ordinance to this particular site. Um, and we've really, really tried hard to incorporate every suggestion and, and desire of staff so that we could check as many comp plan boxes as possible to distill it down to just these couple of issues that we're gonna talk about. So there's really, this is a slightly dated slide, apologize for that, but there's really really three things um, that we have not been able to meet that the comp plan asks of us. And one of those is the TOD designation that we'll, we'll speak about a little bit. Um, but the first, the primary one is the mix of uses, um, really the housing mix of uses in the comp plan. The comp plan foresees the downtown corridor being 90% multifamily and 10% single family. That's the highest multifamily concentration out of any future land use district um, in the comp plan. And it makes sense because the downtown corridor is the most urban district in Plano. So it's going to, going to receive more multifamily interest, served by four transit stops. Um, so we think, we think it actually makes sense for, given the ability to kind of clean up this, this part of uh, the block to actually exceed the 90% in this case. Um, and I'd say lastly, you know, we hope to see more single family delivered here, but I think it'll be in small little bites here and there, kind of a creative townhome development or the, the custom home here and there. But uh, the mix will continue to be probably more multifamily as we deliver you know, 300 units and, and bigger chunks. Um, so that's the mix of uses. The, the second item we've not been able to um, you know, fully meet is the environmental health area. We're in the EHA2, um, we're close to the highway. We're close to transit. We view that as a positive for this site, given you get people where they need to go quickly. And I think residents will appreciate that like they did next door. Um, but because this EHA was new to us, it wasn't part of our development um, next door. We really lean on staff's direction um, in a big way here to design through those mitigation measures. So Adam talked about putting our garage on the south side. That's not an ideal location for it, but it blocks a lot of noise being there, right? So it's helpful to our residents. We stripped off the balconies in the south, southern building and and have done some things with uh, air filtration to, to make this a more livable site. And then the third, really the third item um, that was discussed in detail was, was the density of this project. 
So we're sitting at 65 units per acre. If you don't, if you don't consider this TOD, then we're above the recommended density. But if you do, that would bump us up to uh, 100 units per acre cap and we'd be fine. So um, P and Z felt it was a TOD site because Richardson and, and Plano kind of share that stop down at City Line Bush. And a lot of our residents next door actually walked down there. So um, we view it as uh, an integral part of the, kind of the transit corridor throughout um, this area and would ask that council also view it as TOD to kind of remove that, um, that item. And then uh, ultimately we're asking um, council to view this re rezoning request through two lenses is uh, one being the guiding principles, which we believe our plan is aligned with Plano today, Plano 2050 and Plano together. And then two, uh, the other lens is, is this request, this zoning decision, substantially beneficial to the immediate neighborhood, the surrounding community and the general public interest? Our immediate neighbors on the east and west, um, the hotel is in full support of us. Uh, the controlling partner in Aura 190 um, has sent in a letter, even though we'll now be kind of competing with them <laughs> with more multifamily. They're eager to see these special use permits removed and kind of the area cleaned up um, kind of be a better neighbor for those projects. And then secondly, our project is beneficial to the, the surrounding downtown Plano community. There's many business owners eager for more residents to sustain and grow their downtown businesses as this portion of the city transitions away from its more industrial past into something more livable. And, uh, and lastly, the general public benefits from our proposal by having a, a new inviting Southern Gateway and, and more walkable housing options. Those are uh, somewhat limited in the city right now. Here's the two uh, support letters from the hotel on the left and then the controlling partner in Aura 190 on the right. And then, then lastly, in closing, um, before we get to any questions, uh, I know uh, I drove past it on the way up. Dart Silver Line Station is making great progress right there. It's exciting to see. Uh, with that, I know PNZ and staff are actually act studying uh, those areas around those stations and really the whole corridor together to see what makes sense for maybe adding more density around there, uh, looking at rezoning efforts. So we're a little ahead of that process, but I think um, this is really an excellent opportunity for the council to vote in favor of a positive redevelopment at a really what's currently kind of a blighted site at a highly visible southern boundary of the city. Doing so would be an excellent step toward realizing the comp plan's vision for a more accessible, walkable, and unified downtown corridor. Thank you for your time. We'll Thank take you. any questions together. Appreciate it. Any questions for the applicant? Mayor Pro Tem. So you mentioned moving all the balconies to the north. So on that farthest north side, will there be balconies overlooking the a minor vehicle repair shop on the north side? The north side, there will be balconies on that side. Okay. We've got, I'm trying to remember, our, you know, we've got, we've got landscaping on front of our building. We've got parking, we've got the fire lane, and then we have the 10 foot landscape buffer. So I think we're back about, I don't know, Ra, if you remember, how many feet? 300. Three, no, I think it's 300. You're talking about the north, the north side? I think we're, I think we're about 65 feet from the north side with, you know, with the buffer, if you're looking north to south on the, on the site plan, you've got the 10 foot landscape buffer. You've got the parking spots that are 18 to 20 feet. You've got the fire lane that are 24 feet. And then we have another 10 foot buffer with sidewalk and planning that are building. So that north side will have balconies. One item of note, when you're looking at this plan, the yellow is our planned amenity areas. So, you know, 50% of that north side will be amenity areas and not necessarily somebody's balcony. Uh, so that'll be mitigated, you know, through, through that, you know, through those items, if that makes sense. Okay. Thank you guys. Appreciate it Thanks. very much. Any other? All right. Close the public hearing, combine the comments of the council. Sorry. Go, go, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Mayor well, I, I think this area of Plano really needs some revitalization. And so um, I, I think it's, it's great to see that 
uh, somebody wants to come in and revitalize it. So um, I would be in support of, um, of this request. So I'll make a motion to approve. Hold on, I know. I'll second it for the purpose of keeping it moving. Let me let me have Anthony's got a question. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I was just going to make my comments on the first call. Say thank you to the applicant for um, putting so much thought into the into the application and uh, for working with the staff on all of the changes that were made, particularly environmental mitigation and uh, looking at all of the factors under the comp plan. Um, I do think there are a lot of uh, pluses here. Um, you know, I, I would highlight that with uh, schools in this area under capacity, this would certainly be a plus for the schools. Um, you know, uh, I think also the location, particularly the TOD element and the, uh, the redevelopment that the mayor pro tem highlighted, th those, are, those are positives. Um, you know, the, the traffic obviously would increase somewhat. That, that, that's a negative, though, not the, the most significant factor in my analysis. Um, as I looked at this, um, you know, really the, the, the key uh, factor to me is, is the comprehensive plan. And under the comprehensive plan, uh, you know, it doesn't meet the dashboards. And so to me, for it to be something that we would make findings about to, to say, you know, this is a reason to deviate from the comprehensive plan, it would have to be a critical, you know, redevelopment. <clears throat> I, I view it as a, a beneficial redevelopment, certainly, but I, I don't view it as, as a critical redevelopment. The existing uses may not be the most flashy, but they're, they're not especially pernicious or, or rapidly deteriorating like we've seen in some other areas where we've gone above and beyond um, to, you know, to deviate from, from the comp plan to support redevelopment. Um, and, and I do think there are potentially other uses, maybe even industrial uses. You know, there could be an Amazon, you know, small distribution warehouse or, you know, maybe some other type of uh, you know, technological use here. Um, but anyway, I look also at the, the fact that we're already more than the 2,000 units um, that, that uh, I think were envisioned by the, the downtown vision uh, back in 1999. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and also think of my, my vote on the, the First Baptist case where it was the same deal, you know, kind of just a, a redevelopment that brings multifamily without a mix of uses. I voted no on that, so I'll, I'll stay consistent. But in closing, I just... You know, I want to say that I, I think the comprehensive plan is, is really important. So I, I really appreciate what you guys are doing. Um, but, you know, we, uh, the comprehensive plan has flexibility. We've already used that flexibility to make findings. But the comprehensive plan does matter. And, uh, you know, I'm concerned that we might make it too routine to make findings to say, you know, we're going to deviate from the dashboards for this reason. For that reason, uh, you know, I look at this and it's, it's market rate, so it's not necessarily uh, making the level of impact on housing affordability that the other development where we made findings did. And, you know, I would highlight that, that you know, even after all of the great work that you guys did with the staff, which I really appreciate, the staff report still says there are significant challenges posed by multifamily residential development within the subject property and sums up a, a list of those challenges by saying that due to the issues above, the subject property is not appropriate for multifamily residential use. So while I, I appreciate how hard y'all have worked with the staff and all of the pluses that this brings, I think ultimately I would go back to that statement that this subject property is not appropriate really for residential use and, uh, um, and also the dashboards and the comprehensive plan. So I'll have to vote now. Deputy Mayor. I respectfully disagree with um, uh, Councilman Riccadelli. I, I believe that um, East Plano has waited 30-something years for something to be developed in that area, specifically something that actually passed our planning and zoning um, board in which they agree that it is um, crucial to the, uh, to the development and for TOD reasons they have approved. Um, I also, I, I just have a comment. I, because this piece of property is um, is directly in front of a very visible highway. I, I would like to see that some heart and some passion be put into it so that whatever is ultimately developed there would represent the city of Plano. Just because there is a high demand right now for um, rental properties doesn't mean that you have to hurry it up and get something slapped together 
and put up like a barrack in order for um, people to move in quickly. I, I think that ultimately the more um, care and, and, um, and details that you put into some type of building that will represent Plano and having people who are driving by in that highway area see that that's a very represent, uh, representative of Plano will really ultimately help you and, felt, and help Plano in, um, in encouraging more this type of development. So I, I hope that you will not be the, the, um, the, the cause of our deviating from our findings, and rather but a, a, a instant, insta, uh, something that actually instigate us from uh, starting to see more of different types of development that could happen around that area. So I, I wholeheartedly um, support this type of um, deviation from our planning and zoning um, uh, comprehensive plan. And I, I, I absolutely appreciate the fact that you guys are willing to, to develop East Plano. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councilmember Smith, Councilmember Homer. Um, I also will express my support for this area. I thought the Planning and Zoning um, Commission were very thoughtful in their evaluation of this project, and I agreed with all of the, um, their, their findings. Um, it definitely is a, a TOD area. I think uh, this development is much better than what's there right now. It'll present a better gateway to Plano, represent Plano better. It's definitely easy access to transit. It's pedestrian friendly. I love that it's easy access to uh, the parks and the trails. So I appreciate all the thought that's been put into making this um, something that will make um, the entrance into Plano more welcoming and, and I'm supportive as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also, I mean, I watched the, the, the whole PNZ uh, meeting, and I think everything we know, it this real this does fit in the uh, transit-oriented design, uh, it, you know, if anything does. And as I say, I've, I've lived here well over 30 years. No offense to the existing owners, but this has been a blight for that whole time. I mean... You, know, you just wait and something, what's going to go there? What's going to go there? Hotel here, apartment sitting over there, nothing. Uh, so I think that w the fact that we have uh, a uh, reputable group coming in that has experience doing this type of, of project and is willing to, to make the investment there uh, is, is going to be a benefit. It will give additional housing in an area where it's not, as you said, in residential multifamily you know, backyards. I think that's, that's, that's very good. Uh, and it, uh, it will fit in, I believe, with the, uh, uh, with the surroundings. One thing I would amplify that uh, Deputy Mayor mentioned, do put some imagination in it. Uh, you know, I, I know you've already got renderings and everything put, but this is an entry point you know, to, to the city. Don't, don't do the, the Berlin box apartments that, that you see up going up and down you know, 75. Do something with a little style to it. Uh, you know, that... That will be the biggest plus you can do for us is make it welcoming and attractive, you know, to this part of town. Because I think this hopefully will also uh, stimulate further development in this area. So I don't, I don't think your the the neighbors on the, the north side there are going to be looking out their balconies at auto or or like a little mini warehouse kind of looking buildings, you know, for much longer. I think this will be the impetus to get some other other development going. So so I'm I'm in favor of it also. Councilmember Grady. Um, I appreciate all the comments all the way around um, from my peers. Um, long before the land between Plano and Richardson was bisected by uh, 190, um, this was basically the south side of the tracks um, and a place where you'd find cotton mills and corn gins and um, you know all kinds of industrial things that would, would go on alongside the railroad tracks. Um, and, and since then, it hasn't really had an opportunity to grow up uh, for a long period of time. Um, the entire landscape through here has changed. Um, certainly, we can see that on the south side of 190 um, in the northern part of Richardson, where City Line is there, State Farm is there, um, and they've built up a very nice community right at that intersection. And I think that this begins to complement that on the north side uh, in, the, in the Plano area. So 
having being someone that actually lived in barracks um, for a period of time, uh, I can tell you that no one, no one except the United States government could build something as ugly and non-functional as a barracks. Uh, and, and I don't think they could even get close to doing that on this site. So I'm not, I have no fear um, that, that any kind of development here would be certainly better than what is already there. Um, and, and so I, I am fully in favor of this development. Thank you. So, yeah, no, it, the, I, I have every reason to believe it. Uh, this is definitely a transit oriented development. Uh, the, the proximity to the Richardson station uh, is, is reason enough for those findings. Uh, but mainly the complicated site that you guys are creating, it was going to be so hard for anybody to do anything with that big easement that's right in the middle. And you guys came up with a, you know, a, a great idea. And, and uh, this has been an eyesore for a long time. I'm sorry if any of the owners are here. I apologize. But... <laughs> Let's let's call it what it is. It it has been a a this is a welcome opportunity to continue to make downtown Plano just a, a, a really great place for people to come and enjoy and live. That we know the demand is there. Uh, the uh, the complex to the north of View Faro by the Toll Brothers filled up in a month, and so I know the demand is there. Uh, and we are, we're having businesses uh, come and grow all throughout uh, part of downtown, north, south, east, and west. And so this is just another opportunity uh, for us to expand downtown and to make it uh, really just a, a great place for, for visitors as well as residents. So uh, we have a motion and a second to... Uh, Approve agenda item number two. Please vote. Motion passes 6 1 with one abstention. Huh? I think I said it right. Okay. Yeah. Shelby abstained. What? Yeah, we're going to take uh, we're going to take a five minute recess to fill out our findings.
number three, consideration to rename Oak Point Nature Park, Oak Point Park Nature and Retreat Center, <laughs> 5901 Las Rios Boulevard, Plano, Texas, to the Nature and Retreat Center at Oak Point Park. Good evening. I'm Ron Smith, your Parks and Recreation Director. Happy to answer any questions you might have about this staff recommended name change of this facility. Anybody else want to wordsmith this item? Make sure you can fix it. Okay. Yeah, okay. Motion to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the name change to what it says right there. <laughs> to approve agenda item number three. Please vote. Thank you. Thank you. That was a softball item right there. Thank you. <laughs> Next item. Item number four, first reading of an ordinance to amend section three of ordinance 2003-6-3, section one of ordinance 2008-4-42, section one of ordinance 2015-10-17, and section one of ordinance 2019-11-15, to extend the non-exclusive franchise granted to Denton County Electric Cooperative Incorporated, doing business as CoServe Electric, a Texas electric cooperative corporation, to use present and future streets, avenues, alleys, roads, highways, easements, and other public rights of ways in the city of Plano, Collin County, Texas, for the purpose of constructing and operating an electric distribution center in the city of Plano and providing a repealer clause, a severability clause, a publication clause, and an effective date. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. Andrew Fortune, uh, Director of Policy and Government Relations. Uh, this is just the first reading um, of our uh, ordinance to extend our CoServe Electric uh, Franchise Agreement. Um, and uh, we're looking to extend it for the period of one year while we, can, while we continue to uh, negotiate the terms of those, that agreement. So uh, fairly routine, but I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if you have any. Any questions for Andrew? This doesn't require action, no. so this is just uh, to let you know kind of where the process is and where it's going. All right. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Item number five. Item number five, consideration of a resolution to repeal resolution 2023-2-2. To R and authorize the city manager to execute an interlocal agreement with the Dallas area rapid transit following Plano participation, allowing Plano participation in funding for public transportation system improvements and providing a real repealer clause and an effective date. Mayor and Council, this item has come before you before and it was tabled uh, due to some of the language within the ILA. After going back and talking with DART, DART is uh, unwilling um, to change the, the language within the IRA, due, IR, ILA, not IRA, ILA, due to some specific requirements that they're trying to achieve with this towards um, some other challenges that DART has faced on some project costs and things of that nature. So in looking at uh, the this dollar amount, which is just over $28 million, the city has a couple of ways to be able to mitigate the impacts of the ILA. The first one is to um, make sure that the city has the financial flexibility to get out of the ILA at any given time. So instead of capturing and budgeting for the budgetary impacts that, that might be created by this $28.4 million, uh, my, re my recommendation to the council is that we treat it uh, strictly as a reimbursement but do not change our budgetary approach uh, to funding these projects so that if there is a need to get out of the ILA at any given time, we can do so without uh, impacting projects that we currently have ongoing um, that could meet uh, the criteria outlined within the ILA. The second aspect is I've asked staff uh, to shift gears as fast as possible into fifth gear and see how fast we can burn through the money so that we can get to the other end of the ILA as fast as humanly possible. So with those two aspects uh, of mitigation, um, I believe that the city can continue to, to retain uh, a certain level of control within how we're uh, managing this 
and we should be able to um, recapture as much of the uh, sales tax that was generated from Plano coming back to Plano as fast as possible. So that's my recommendation. Thanks. This is, uh, this is our money, and uh, I appreciate uh, being expedient about moving along with it, making sure uh, our board members, Paul Wageman and Nathan Barbera, have assured us they will uh, monitor it all the way through and make sure that, you know, uh, we, we have the access to the funds. So uh, you had a question or a comment? Yeah, uh, just a quick Smith. clarifying question. So in a nutshell, we get money back from DART. We have to spend it quickly to be sure that we get all the funds. Yes. I'm in. What? what? Hold on. Councilman Williams. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so the big hang up I have on this ILA is the unchanged language, which says city agrees to work collaboratively, collaboratively with DART employees and contractors um, and employ, employ its best efforts to assist DART in achieving its goals. Could our current efforts in the state legislature be construed a um, violation of this ILA? So, Councilman, part of the challenge with this ILA is it's heavily weighted towards DART's interpretation of things. But in talking with DART and uh, talking with our board members, we've been um, uh, reassured that that should not be the case. But I don't want to make promises on their behalf. So I yes, would I've say, been reassured I would say, many things over the years. Yes. <laughs> so I would say that we're um, we're working in good faith that that would be the case. That we would not be limited in our ability to work with the legislature to cure issues that we see um, from a statutory perspective. So okay. that's our intent. So I want to under make sure I understand what we're positing here is that for all of the projects here, we program these as though we were not going to be receiving any reimbursement. There are our own projects, the same as we would put them in the CIP and then um, move on them as quickly as possible, submit for reimbursement. Any reimbursement we get, we consider a windfall. Yes. Yes, sir. Mayor Program, you done? Okay, <laughs> Councilman Riccadelli. So j just, just a couple of quick questions. First, you know, when we initially considered this, a number of cities had expressed concerns mm -hmm. and were taking the same step that we did to table it. Do we know how those other cities are proceeding at this time? Uh, there were two cities outstanding to pass this at this point. One was Plano, one was Dallas. Okay, and everybody else who expressed concerns at yeah. that time has moved forward. Okay, gotcha. And uh, along the lines of the question that Councilmember Williams uh, asked about things that could be construed as not helping DART achieve its goals, uh, you know, we had a situation where we uh, did not use eminent domain immediately when DART requested us to do so. And I think it produced a very positive outcome where DART engaged in negotiations that produced an outcome that was acceptable to the landowner and to DART. Uh, should such a, a situation arise again during the construction of the Silver Line or another project, would that action be construed as a violation of this agreement? Um, again, Councilman, I, I appreciate the question. I think we'll, we'll have to, we're putting some faith in our relationship with DART in okay. this. So okay. that sort of action, what I've been told is no, that would not. Okay. Um, so I think that that is, you know, I'll hold true to, uh, to the, the comments that have been made to this point. But I think having that flexibility to end the ILA and not be dependent upon it financially gives mm -hmm. us that flexibility to continue to make the right decisions for the community that we need to make. Fantastic. Well, you know, I, I, I don't love the fact that, that, you know, there wasn't a meet in the middle, but, you know, I, I do appreciate the fund, so I'll, I'll, I'll vote yes on this. I'll make a motion to approve. Before I second it, I just want to say that there is a definition of partnership, and I don't believe that this meets that definition, <laughs> but I will second this. Okay. okay. All right. I have a motion to second to approve item, uh, agenda item number five. Please vote. <clears throat> Motion passes eight to zero. There being no further business, meetings adjourned.
any emergencies.